how did it happen when David and his men came to Siglai on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Siglai, attacked Siglai and burnt it with fire, and had taken captive the women and those who were there, from small to great. They did not kill anyone, but carried them away and went their way. So David and his men came to the city, and there he was, burned with fire. And their wives and their sons and their daughters had been taken captive. Then David and the people who were with him lift up their voices and wept until they had no more power to weep. And David, two wives, Ahinamon, the Jezreelite, and Abigail, the widow of Nabal, the Carmelite, had been taken captive. Now David was greatly distressed, for the people had spoke of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved. Every man for his sons, for his daughters, but David strengthened himself in the Lord, his God. And the King James Version says, And David encouraged himself in the Lord, his God. Then David said to Abib, here we go, a strange name, <laughs> Abiathar, the priest, Ahimelech's son, please bring the ephod here to me. And Abijah brought the ephod to David. So David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered them, Pursue, for you shall surely overtake them, and without fail recover all. I thank God for the reading of his words. And I need you guys to say, pursue, pursue. and recover all. And recover all. Let's just say that again. Pursue, pursue. and recover all. And recover all. That's the day that we're living in. Amen. I believe that God wants us to pursue and recover all. All that's been lost, all that's been stolen, and all that we gave away. Okay? Everything was not stolen. Some things we just Flat out, gave away. All right. So, the title of my message is, It's Time to Strengthen Yourself in the Lord. Again. Okay. It's time to strengthen ourselves in the Lord again. Now, David's enemies here from this passage was the Amalekites. We have enemies. Our enemy, when I was first came up in the Lord, I was taught that our enemy was the world, the flesh, and the devil. Well, today I'm not going to get into the flesh. I'm not going to get against the soulish realm, the mind, the will, the emotion. You know that we're three, three parts here. We're, we're body, soul, and spirit. Okay? And our soulish realm, and I'm, I'm focusing on this because so many times in the passage, they speak of the men, their souls were green. That's their mind, their will, their emotion. They were grieved. Okay? So I'm not going to talk about that because so many times we like to charge everything to the devil. And everything's not to the devil. God has given us the part to play. Most of the warfare starts in our minds. Okay? It starts in our minds, and that's why we have to. Captain, make capital starts. Pull down every stronghold, every thought that is also self against the knowledge of God. We have to do that. When we know a thought is not a thought, then it's time for us to say, is that my thought or was that God? Mm. Okay, where did that thought come from? Because that doesn't even sound like God. Okay, so we need to pull down strongholds. But anyway, I'm going to get back to this. David had enemies. We have enemies. We have enemies. One particular enemy that we focus on a lot, and his name is Satan. Okay? And Job, forgive me, John 10 and 10 say the enemy comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But we know that Christ has come that we may have life and have it more abundantly. 
The strange thing about that is the devil is defeated. Colossians 2.15 said that Jesus made an outward sure of him, that he disarmed principalities, he disarmed powers, and he made an outward sure of them. He triumphed over them openly, openly in it, in the cross. He did it all on the cross. On the cross, he defeated Satan. So we don't war from a place of defeat. We war from a place of victory. We, we, we war from a place of victory. Jesus has given us all the authority and power that we need. According to Genesis 1.26, he gave us dominion in this earth realm. He gave us dominion, Jordan, in this earth realm. Luke 10, 19, he gave us the power to trade on serpents and scorpions and upon all the work of the enemy. And he said, nothing by any means shall harm us. So we have to fight from our place of victory of what Jesus already did for us. Okay? It's not time to put the white flag up. It's really not. It's not time to surrender. Okay, because there is a warfare going on. But anyway, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to stick stick right here to the word of God. So when David and his men came to the city, they found that it was burning. Their wives and their children were taken captive. Now they didn't know that. They didn't know if their wives and their children were dead or alive. Okay? So they wept. The word of God said they wept until they had no more power to weep. Wow. Oh my God. Have y'all ever experienced anything like that before? You wept until you had no more power to weep. David was greatly distressed. And, and, and so much so. David was greatly distressed because David had traveled with these men. Okay, They were called David and his mighty men. They were 600 plus men. So David had a bond with his men. David had shown his men who he was. So now, for something like this to happen, they were so greatly distressed until they couldn't think about anything else. That's fine, David. <laughs> <laughs> they wanted to stone David because when things happen in our lives, so many times we don't look at us. We look at someone else and blame. Okay, we like to point the finger in a hurry. Well, it wasn't my fault. If she should have, could have, would have. If she would have done this, if, she, if he would have done this. Not in this day and time. Okay? God wants us to be accountable. He wants us to take accountability for the things that happen in our lives. Okay? And many times, the things that happen in our lives is just because of a lack a fellowship, a lack of prayer, a lack of seeking God and asking Him for the answer, as opposed to getting ahead of God. Mm -hmm. Yes. So anyway, so David, David was grieved. You know, and every time I see those words, I see these words in the Scripture. I think about times that we have been living in in these last years. You know. Some people can say all of their lives. But the last couple of years have been amplified. Well, let me just say this. We have to remember who David was, even in the midst of this. We have to remember that David was a shepherd, even as a boy. David was a shepherd. He watched for the sheep. So David was the one who wrote, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not walk. He made me to lie down in green pastures. He leaded me beside the still water. He restored my soul. Yeah. So even though their souls were distressed, David knew how to talk to his soul. David knew how to say, Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that's within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Yeah. David said, Why so downcast on my soul? That's Psalm 23. He said, Why so downcast? He talked to his soul. He built himself. Why so dumb that's all my soul? Put your hope in God. Because yet I will praise him. God is my hope. You know, sometimes when we're going through something, we need to be able to encourage ourselves in the Lord by first speaking to our soulish realm. Because then that soulish realm, like I said, the mind, the will, the emotion will begin to talk to you. It's time to say, wait, hold it, hold it, hold it. No, that's not of God. That's, uh, that's not of God. 
Okay, I will not let that thought come out of my mouth because that is not of God. You know, there's times when I am thinking things. I'm talking to people, they're looking at me, they're listening, I'm listening to them, and I'm thinking about what we're going to say next. How many of y'all do that? We think about who we're going to say next to that person. And I'm thinking, and all of a sudden I hear this quiet voice inside of me say, don't say anything. Just don't. You can nod, you can smile, you can be polite, but don't say anything. And that's the Holy Spirit telling me, don't say anything until I tell you what to say. Okay? Do I have a piece of a soft answer? It turns me around. You know, everybody don't need to know our opinion. This has been our business. <laughs> Thank you. They really don't. They don't. We think we need to share everything. We don't need to do that. And you know one thing that really gets me is when I hear people say, well, I just need to share my truth. Excuse me? Your truth? Oh, there's a new truth in the neighborhood? Okay. I thought Jesus was the way, the truth, and the law. There's no other truth. Okay? Your truth is simply your opinion. That's all it is. It's something you want to get off of your chest. Well, People don't understand you, so let me share my truth. What is your truth? So at that point, I listen because it's just the polite thing to do. It's to li listen, to give them an opportunity to share their truth, okay? But anyway, I'm going to take y'all on a little journey right now, and I just need you to be patient with me. But on March 11 of 2020, the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 the disease that was caused by SARS slash COV-2, a pandemic, a potentially lethal virus that swiftly spread around the world. It has been an emotional time that that multiplied rapidly, 2.5 million people had died of this disease. Many of us mourn friends and loved ones. And the grief, and I go back to that word grief, the same thing these men were feeling, the grief along with isolation. We isolated ourselves to prevent infections. It took a toll on our mental health. It really did. Fear, anxiety, stress, suicide, domestic violence, civil unrest, it goes on and on. Businesses shut down, leading to massive job layoffs. Schools closed, leading to a lot of parents having breakdowns. <laughs> That's it, enjoy. But can you imagine having your children in the, in the home with you for 24 hours and teaching them after you haven't been in school for 15, 20, 30 years, maybe? Okay, so that was a challenge. Residents asked to stay home, except for essential workers. Borders closed. People started wearing masks. And social distancing began. In many churches and places of worship, were forced to close their doors. That was a sad time. That was a sad time for the church when we were forced to close our doors. Hebrews 10, 23 said, don't forsake the assembly of yourselves together. As a matter of some, is, But exalting one another in so much store as we, so as we see the day approaching. Look, it's so important to be in the house of the Lord. It's so important to be in a place of fellowship. Mm -hmm. You know, it's one thing to watch it on television, it's another thing to watch it on YouTube, to listen to it, but something happens when the body comes together. Something happens, there's unity. When there's unity, God commands the blessing. We draw strength for one another. We pray for one another. We fellowship with one another. We talk to one another. Okay? We laugh with one another. Our church is our family. 
It's on family. You know, the minister Carol introduced me, she said, she's known me by family. She was introducing me, he said how long she's known me, and then my daughter walked in and she said, and her daughter, and her granddaughter. You know, and I told we are family. Mm -hmm. We are family. We've been knowing one another for so long. We've been fellowshipping. And I draw strength. I draw strength from my sisters, from my brothers, from my pastors. You know, we encourage one another in the Lord. So that was a real trying time. And I'm not trying to take you guys back. I'm really not trying to take you backwards. I'm actually trying to take you forward. Okay, I'm trying to take you forward because when I was asked to speak, you never feel like you have anything, or even if you do have something, you don't want it to be of you. You always want it to be what God wants you to say. Because that's the only thing that's really going to make a difference. You know, I can come here and talk about anything and everything. But what is God saying to his church? What is God saying to his children? So, I just like to be real with you guys. And say that when the pandemic came, I was not prepared. I was not prepared at all. Okay? In so many ways. But there's one thing that the Lord impressed upon my heart when I asked him about coming down here. And that was that we must be prepared that we have to be prepared. That's one thing that I learned in the pandemic. One thing that I learned in the pandemic was that Netflix was not going to help me. I watched the Bridgerton series. I watched the, the, the Queen's Gambit. I watched Emily in Paris. <laughs> you know, I mean, I watched I mean, yeah, I got up in the morning. I'm just being real. I got up in the morning. I said my prayer. I said my prayer at night. But in, the, in between, I just felt like this was kind of like a little vacation, you know, where you just get to, to do things that you never do. I was, I've never been a, a big television watcher. I just wasn't. But I turned the television on because I didn't want to hear all that was happening. Okay? There was social unrest at the time. There were people. I mean, I don't want to see the policemen uh, uh, having to oh God, try to keep the peace by you know, I mean, beating people, people shooting, uh, they're tearing down stores, they're looting, they're doing all kinds of things. There's nothing nice about that. I didn't want to watch that. And I truly got tired of just seeing the same things over and over and over. So that's when I decided I turned to Netflix. Okay? But guess what? Netflix do not eat do so. Netflix do not fill you up. Okay, yeah, there's some documentaries on there and what have you that you might say educate you keep yourself. But it just wasn't doing it for me. It just wasn't doing it for me. So I say that because we got into so many things during the pandemic because we had no idea that it was going to last that long. We had no idea that we were going to be isolated. Okay? So therefore, we started doing things that we didn't need to do that was not really our spirit man up. Okay? But God said not so, not this time. Okay, I let you go through that. I kept you, I carried you through that, but now there's some lessons to learn from that. Okay? And one lesson that we need to learn, and I'm not saying this by any means that there would be any condemnation on anyone, but we got, we're going to have to up our game. As, as the body of Christ, as believers, as, the, as those who said Jesus is our Savior, He's not just our Savior, He wants to be our Lord. He wants to be Lord of every area of our lives. Amen. Every area. You know, we live in America and I thank God for it. But so many times, because we live in America, we've gotten so accustomed to, if we run out of this or that, we run to the grocery store. If we get sick, we go to the doctor. You know, we don't pray about it first. We just say, I need to go to the doctor. Okay, we may pray and ask God to lead us to the right doctor. Okay, but many times we already know in our minds what we're going to do next. God said not so. True. He wants to lead us. He yes. wants to guide yes. us. He yes. wants to direct us. He said, seek me while I may be found. Right. Call upon me while I am near. Let the wicked man forsake his way and the righteous is God. And turn to the Lord. Okay? He wants us to turn to Him. 
Okay, I'm gonna get, get, get some more paper here because actually I got uh, a little carry away here. Okay, with the Netflix. But referring back to David and his men, they obviously did not expect to find what they found when they got home. Who expected to find that your home, that your city was burned down? So in verse 4 states that they wept until they had no more power to weep. You know, Proverbs 24 10 says, if you faint in the day of adversity, it says in your strength is small. The strength is very small at that time. Things in our life may look discouraging. They may even appear hopeless. But that's not the end. That is not the end. That's not the final report. God has the final word in the life of his children. Lamentations 3.22. It doesn't matter what it looks like. Lamentations 3.22 said, Jeremiah said he had lost hope. But then he thought to himself and said, it is of the Lord's mercies that I am not consumed, because his compassion failed not. They are new every morning. Amen. Great is thy faithfulness. Amen. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. In him I will hope. That word again, that hope word, again I will hope. He hope in the Lord. And we have to think about that, no matter what we go through. The Lord's mercies are new every morning. Every morning you have a fresh, a fresh start. A Amen. fresh start with God. You know, he's from God. No, if you say, 1 John 1 and 9 says, confess your sins. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So no matter what you did yesterday, all you need to do is wake up in the morning and say, God, forgive me. Or before you go to bed, Lord, please forgive me. I made a mistake. I spoke out of turn. I was impatient toward my sister, toward my I didn't show up. I didn't show to forgive me. And guess what? He said, he's already forgotten his sins. He's already removed them. As far as the east is from the west, he removed them, he remembers those things no more. So God gives us all a fresh start every morning. He don't want us wallowing in the mistakes that we make. God already knew we were going to sin and make mistakes before we did. That's why Jesus went to the cross. So David recalls his mind how God delivered him. How God delivered him from Goliath. How God delivered him from Saul. He remembered those things. We need to remember what God has done for us in the past. Don't forget, we're so busy. I'm so busy. Living from day to day to day. Sometimes we need to think about what God has done for us in the past. Okay? About his goodness, about his mercy, his loving kindness toward us, his patience. He's been patient with us. He waited for us to get to a place of seeking him, of calling upon his name. We didn't start out like that. We didn't start out like that. We started out as babies in the Lord. Many of us did not even know how to pray. When I started out and I walked to church and the pastor said, okay, turn to the book of Colossians. I didn't know where the book of Colossians was. He said, turn to the book of Ezekiel. I had to go. I said, do you know what, Lord? I'm just going to the front of the book. Okay, I'm ashamed of my game. I'm tired of this man calling out these names I never heard before. Okay? And so I need to go and find the book. I found it. But I'm going to tell you what happened in the midst of that. That not only happened, but every time we walked in, he'd say, Sister Ann, I need you to get First John. Sister So-and-so, I need you to get Deuteron Deuteronomy. I need you to get Psalms. I need you to get that. He did me that once. And I was embarrassed because I didn't know how to find the book. But guess what? I became like the Bereans in the book of Acts. Okay, I went home and studied the book to see if what he was saying was so number one, but also to acquaint myself. <laughs> I was talking to Tommy on my way up here about the love for the word. I fell in love with the word. Okay, because basically it was a word church where I mean, he didn't care whether you knew or whether you didn't. He just tell you, you know, I'll get your, get this, get that. 
but it made me search the word. It made me go home and study, okay? And I fell in love with the word, and I didn't know at the time that in the beginning was the word, and the word was God. And the word was with God. And he became flesh, and he dwelt among us. He moved into the neighborhood. He moved into my life. So the word was Jesus Christ. So every time I ate of this word, I ate of Jesus. And every time I read this word, I strengthened myself in the Lord. I built myself up. So then when it came to a place, where I was called up in front of people to pray, then I was able to pray because I prayed the word. Because the Holy Spirit brought it back to my memory. Because that is what he does. That's what the comforter who Jesus has given us, that's one thing that he will do. He said he will recall all things to our memory, all things that he has said. What did he say? Everything he said was in the word. Everything he said. So when you get into the word of God, you're getting into God. You're getting closer to him. You're giving the Holy Spirit something to work with. Okay? It's just like anything else. If you feed yourself three times a day, and, and many people do some people, twice a day. That is nourishment. Your body needs to be nourished by natural food. How much more spiritual food? We need spiritual food. And the Lord is impressing upon my heart that I'm not happy. I mean, where I am right now, he's not pleased with that. That I need to eat more of the word. That I need to spend more time with him. Because there's some things that's coming and nobody knows for God. And the only way you're going to know the mind of Christ is that you read the words of God. You have to read the word to know what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. You know? But anyway. All right. Let me get back. In times of trouble, but at all times, never forget what God has done for us. Okay? Now, I'm going to verse number 8. I'm just going to read that real quick. And it says, So David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue this truth? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him. Who? God answered him and said, Pursue, but you shall surely overtake them without fail, recover all. That's like a breath of fresh air. When the Lord speaks to you, it's settled. It's settled. You don't have to question it. You don't have to call your friend on the phone like you normally do. You know. You don't have to do that. He's like, God said it, there was no saying who was it. God said it, that's that was it. That's it. That's the end of the conversation. You don't have to conversate with nobody else. Because he gives you a knower. A knowing in your knower. The old people used to say, you know in your knower. You just knew this was God who spoke to you. Okay? You know by the spirit. By the spirit of God. So I just uh, I'm just going to go on. So God encourages his people through prayer and through different situations that we go through. God will answer our prayer. God all things. He will not just answer our prayer, but he will give us the instructions. Many times we need to pray and ask God for the instructions. Mm -hmm. Ask him for the strategy. You know? I mean, it's just like war. Okay? You have to have a strategy when you're going up against the enemy. Right. And you can't come up with that by yourself. God is the general here. You know, he's the most of the army. Captain of the army of the Lord. Okay, okay. Now, I think I've said all that to say one thing, just to come to this conclusion. And the conclusion is, first I'd like to say, before I say any of this other stuff, there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made us free from the law of sin and death. So we don't need to feel condemned or be condemned by anything that 
anyone says except the Lord. Okay? The Lord is not going to condemn you. He's going to convict you. He will not condemn. But I'd like to say that what the Lord impressed upon my heart is that He kept us through this pandemic. But there's something coming that, like I said before, only God knows. And it's necessary for us to be prepared. It's necessary, how do we prepare ourselves? When one way the Lord was impressing upon me, of course, is prayer. Okay? We have to pray. We have to, we have to pray. When God wakes you up in the morning at 3 o'clock or 4 o'clock in the morning, don't get up a little refrigerator. Okay? Don't turn on the television. You don't need to watch nobody. You don't need to go and eat. It's time. He's waking you up to fellowship with you. He said, Lord, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears me and opens the door, I will come in. Now, if you want to eat? He said, I will come in and sup with you. He will come in and eat with you and you with him. Okay? He's waking you up to fellowship with you. He's waking you up when there's no distractions. There's nothing. Nothing to interfere with the time between you and God. You see, God is a jealous God. Okay? It says, but the point is that God is a jealous God. He will not have any other gods before him. He don't want anybody before him. And he is your father. The only reason why God made us was for fellowship. Exactly. He don't need us. He wants us. Exactly. He wants to fellowship with us. You know, I didn't he was walking with God in a pool of the day. How beautiful that is. To be able to talk to God. I mean, it, it, to me, that's just, it's, it's just so awesome that the God who made everything will come down and suck with us. And one of my favorite scriptures is in the Psalms, Psalm David said, what is man? And God is mindful of him. Or the son of man, that God would visit him. But God has made him a little more than the angels. He's crowned us with glory and honor. And he put all things under our feet. He gave us dominion over all things. Look how important you are to God. You are ambassadors in this earth realm. As if God was crying through us to the unsaved. Repent. Repent. For the kingdom of God is at hand. Now look, God wants to use us. Okay? In this earth realm. It's time for us to recognize what we signed up for. Coming to church is fine. As I said, the Bible said, don't you say this sinning of yourself together. We are the believers. That's fine and that's good. Okay? But you don't want just church members. There's a whole world out there that's lost. I believe just about everybody in here has a relationship with Jesus Christ. You've committed, you've given your life. Okay? You made him Savior. You made him Lord. But there's a whole world out there that God is concerned about. There's lost souls that needs to be reached. And you know, one of the first things that was told to me as a as a young, the first time I heard the pastor say this in church, I, I, I kind of, I had to repent because I got offended. But he said, uh, he was telling us about going out of ministry. And he said, sheep beget sheep. Mm -hmm. And I was like, sheep beget sheep. Why can't you go out there and minister? You, you're the shepherds, you ought to be able to pull them in, you know. But as time went on, I understand it. I understood that because I lived that. Because when my husband and I became pastors, I lived that. And I understood. The pastor's to put into you. He's to put into you. But he's not to carry you. He's not to carry you. Okay? The Bible said, let your light so shine before men, before God, that men will see your good works and glorify the Father which is in heaven. Well, what are you talking about? My daughter was telling me the other day, to a certain extent, more is taught than what is taught. People are going to watch you. They're going to see you walk. Okay, how do you act on the job? 
How are you in the supermarket? Because the stove is a little slow and she's just learning. Are you ready to just storm out of there? Are you ready to curse her out? Do some words that's not even. Okay. That's not Christ like behavior. On the job, do they know that you're a believer? Do they know? Okay. I mean, come on. They're going to watch what you do more than what you say. You quote scriptures all day long. But what about, what about your walk? What about love? Okay. What about faith? Jesus says, when you return to this earth, will you find faith in the earth? Of all things he could have asked about, faith. He said, well, I find faith. Faith is trust in him, not in yourself. Okay, don't leave. He don't want his name to all understand. Everybody knows the scripture and Proverbs. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not. Come on, you all know it, right? In all thy ways, and he will. Be not wise.
Okay, we hear all the time in Jeremiah 29 11, but God does know us to plan through the thoughts that He has for us. Plans are good and not of evil to give us a future and a hope. And it's faith in the end. But there is so much going on with our youth now. I didn't understand when I was listening to the news and a court session was going on in Houston with the parents and the school board as to the children deciding what pronoun they wanted to use. I had no clue what that meant. I kept listening. What pronoun? What are you talking about a pronoun? You know, when I was coming up, you didn't have a choice about what you ate, what time you went to bed, what you wore, whether you were going to church. You were going to church. You had to be half dead if you, look, you couldn't say you were sick. Okay, you sick, mama came in gently, pulled the covers back, she, she fell on your head, your face, she took your temperature, she went all the way down that body to make sure you show uh, what was the matter? What was hurting you? You know? And after she inspected you, if she didn't buy anything wrong with you, okay, well, uh, you still have time, okay? You got about 10 minutes there. Get up and get dressed. I'm going to comb your hair, put your shoes on, and we're going to church. Yep. Mother had nine children. We were like little Dublins. We walked to church. And the whole entire time that I was living with my parents, my daddy, my daddy never owned the car. We walked everywhere we went. If we didn't walk, we caught the bus, okay? But I'm talking, I'm talking blocks, okay, miles now to walk to church. You didn't do that one time a day, okay? You went to church in the morning, okay? That was Sunday school. Mama was there because she wasn't gonna take us back home, so we said Sunday school, church, all right? We walked back home, she fed us. No fast food. We didn't know. That didn't even exist. Okay? You ate. And that evening you went back to church. You walked again. We didn't give up. Our children had no choice. They didn't decide. I heard people saying, now, oh well, I attend this church and I attend that church, but when she's old enough, she'll decide where she wants to go. You, you, excuse me? Decide? No, you don't get to decide. You know, I remember sitting to the table, it was about 8 o'clock at night, after dinner was fixed at what, around 5? And I, I, I'm just sitting there. And finally my mom came in and she said to my dad, okay, that's enough. Let her go and take her bath. Obviously, she's not going to eat this. It was green peas. I did not like green peas. But the, the rule in my, my mom's house and my dad's house was, you're going to eat whatever they put in front of you. Yep, yep. You didn't have a choice. And the only reason why I'm bringing all this up is because of choices. We didn't have a choice. Okay? If you were under their roof, you were buying by their Ooh. Okay? It didn't matter. It didn't matter. So we have gone so far. So very far. Look how far. Oh, glory. So, something else I wanted to say that was brought to my memory. I used to wake up in the morning. And my mom would already be in the kitchen, and she would be kneading, I guess it's called kneading, bread. She'd be rolling the bread, you know, getting the bread ready. I'm going to have Bread for breakfast. And she was always talking to herself. Every time we turned the corner, she was just talking. And I used to think, oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Is my mom crazy? Has she lost her mind? Every time I come in the kitchen, this lady's talking to herself. I was just, I was young. I was very young. You know, I was around six, seven years old. I didn't understand. Mama wasn't talking. I had to get grown or to find out, to realize she was talking to God. That was her practice. Before we woke up in the morning, she prayed for us.
she prayed over us. Okay? She anointed our home before we woke up in the morning. And this is what I'm hearing God said. We want to be so progressive, but sometimes we need to go back to the old ways. Amen. Sometimes we need to not forget the old ways. The way we were brought up, the way we were reared, the fear of God was in us. Okay? The fear of God. If you look around, there's no more fear of God. How can you fear God and you want to get in a car? Okay? At 17 years old, with a gun, mm. and shoot somebody who's driving on the side of you who didn't do you anything but possibly cut you off. Is that a reason to take a life? You did without any remorse. The fear of God is absent in so many places. And we know who's behind that. We know who's behind that. Okay, but the fear of God needs to come back. He said, don't forget the old ways. Don't forget, I had a scripture somewhere for that, y'all. And, and I tried to, because it was, when I read it, it just touched my heart. And actually, I, it made me cry because God is so awesome. And he loves us so very much. And we don't even realize what we're doing. You know what? When I, I spoke with my daughter, because I remember an incident when she was transitioning from elementary school to middle school. And I remember my husband said to me, we were just having a conversation, he said, oh well, he said, look like May's going to be an Alaska kid this year. And I said, it was like righteous indignation just broke. I said, no, she's not. She's not coming here on this corner, put the key in the door by herself. I said, oh, no, no, no. I said, no, she's not. She's not going to be no last key kid. So my husband and I prayed. We prayed about it. And was it a week, maybe? I think maybe a week, three weeks. A few weeks went by. And I went to the job. I did my job as usual, I was working in the medical profession as a radiologic technologist. And I thought all was going well. And the doctor called me in the office and he said, you know, you're such a good employee and I love your work and da 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 He said, but I'm gonna have to cut your hours, have to cut you back. He said, uh, because our senses is dropped. And we're not seeing this many patients. Well, he expected me to be upset. He said, so if money's a problem, I can give you a... And I said, no, money's not a problem. Money's not a problem. So I walked out. And I, you know, I was so joyful. <laughs> and uh, when I got to the elevator, I had to say something against the elevator. I started praising the Lord. I said, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Glory. You know, but, but that wasn't, that wasn't all. The best part was, I left that day. I worked half day, I left, I went home, I started cooking, started frying chicken, and we used to leave the gate open, we used to enter the back. So the next thing I know, Megan had gotten off the bus, which was like a block away. She walked down the street, she ran around the corner, she was all excited. And she was going, Mother, Mother, Mom, Mother, I'm so glad you're home. God answered my prayers. God answered my prayers. That was the highlight of the day for me. When she said, God answered my prayers. And I said, well, when did you pray? She said, I prayed that you would be home. I prayed. And when I came around the corner, I smell the chicken. You <laughs> the chicken. <laughs> but look, look how important that is. The Bible said when two or three of us come together in agreement, yes. Yes. such as such as anything in earth, that he would be right in the midst. Okay, yes, my husband and I prayed, but my child prayed. Okay? And she said the most touching and moving thing to her was not so much learning about. 
by prayer, but getting up seeing her daddy sitting at the kitchen table every morning praying. Exactly. Okay? Pray. And he would pray. Exactly. You know, he would connect, connect, connect. Back then, in the old days, you had to connect, call one person on the phone, get them to connect with maybe five other brothers, exactly. okay? And then that, those brothers had to connect somebody else and connect somebody else. And he had never been arguing about AT&T charging him too much. <laughs> he was all Africa. <laughs> he was all, if the Lord put place anybody on his heart, he was going to call and pray. But the other thing is, she said, to see her mother pray. To hear her mother pray. To hear her mother use radical faith. And she said, devil, I'm tired of you. This car don't belong to me. This car belongs to God. And all I knew was that God had blessed me with the car and the car shouldn't have been breaking down like that. So I took my oil, went outside, pulled my oil in the car, <laughs> told the devil, screamed at the top of my voice, devil, this don't belong to me. Exactly. It belongs right. to God. Amen. Yeah. When I leave here, I'm leaving this car. Get your hands out of my car. Exactly. Okay. The next thing I knew, I didn't pay much attention to it, but my husband did. He said, you used to take care of the car. Mm -hmm. When we go to church, he gets up and he says, well, I have a testimony because after my wife went outside, he said, I really thought she was, something was wrong with her, but when she went outside and put that all in that car and prayed, he said, we had not had to take that car to the shop in six weeks. All I do is change the oil. <laughs> you, you see, but it was my radical faith that God honored. And the thing is, is that my child saw that. She saw that, okay? And so I said all this to say, it's important now that you speak over your children. Yes, speak over your children. Before they leave that house to go to that school, it's time to pray. Declare, decree a thing. Job 22, 28 says, you can declare a thing and it shall be established for you. Okay? God has given us power and authority. In this earth realm, we need to take the place that God has placed. Do the things that God has placed us in this earth realm to do. I mean, we're doing everything else except for what God wants us to do in this season. Teach your children the word. They have great memories. Memorization every week. Give them a scripture. Give them a scripture to memorize. And sit there and memorize that scripture with them. You know, people, children will not respect what you do not inspect. If you give them an assignment, you better check up on it. Okay? You better let them know that we're going to do this. I remember... My granddaughter, when I got ready, they, uh, we were doing some type of uh, play at church, and she loved to praise dance at the time. So I told her, well, Jay, you just can't praise dance. You need to know scripture. She learned the 23rd Psalm in, in a week. That's, that's the kind of minds they have. Okay? Don't, don't, don't sell it short. Teach your children the word. Teach your children to pray. Teach your children to, to apply the blood of Jesus when they go through their schools. Teach your children when they're walking around at lunchtime to say, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. Anytime they rise up against me in judgment, I will condemn. For this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. It's of his righteousness that the Lord. I don't care what comes here, but no weapon, no physical weapon, no spiritual weapon, no weapon formed against us will prosper. Let them walk around the school. Let them plead the blood of Jesus. It's nothing wrong with pleading the blood. Okay? The blood that was shed on Calvary's cross for our protection, not just for your salvation. The blood still speaks. The blood still works. It's the blood of Jesus. It's better than any sacrifice. Sacrifice of bulls, all that didn't work. Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice. Teach your children to pray. Teach them to pray for those in authority that we may be able to lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness, in all reverence. 
don't talk about your children's teachers with them. Listen to your children, what they're saying, because you need to know. But don't do that. Let them know that is the authority figure. When you're there, you need to obey and listen to them, unless she, that person tells you something that don't line up with the word of God. At that point, you go to the office and you call me. And then I, as the adult, will take over. But all authority is subject to God. Teach them. You see, that's where a spirit of rebellion comes in if they don't learn how to submit to authority. You can't be siding with your children with everything they say. Do you know our children is one way at home and another way when they leave us? No, I, I'm not saying all children. I'm not saying all children. Not at all. But when children get with other children, okay, okay, then naturally they're going to be children. Childish. Childish. They're not supposed to be grown. They, you know, so they do childish things. And, and, and they're not always bad things, they're just silly things. You know, if, if, you, if you're in the back of the room mocking everything your teacher say, and your teacher turn around, <laughs> and, and you're not the one who did it, but you're sitting there laughing with the ones who did it, okay, well, you're a part of that. You're a part of that. So, like I said, it's not always negative or bad things, but our children need prayer. They need prayer, they need discipline, just like we do. Our Heavenly Father discipline us. So many times I would try to correct Megan or discipline her in a certain area and the Holy Spirit would speak through me and say, well, how can you tell her that? How can you tell her about obeying you but you're not obeying me? I say, uh, excuse, <laughs> excuse me, Lord, did I not obey you? It may have been one thing that I didn't do that the Lord told me or two things or something, but he used my child to let me see. Just as important it is for her to obey you, it's important for you to obey me. Okay? So, if I don't say anything else today, all I'm saying is to myself, because Hebrews 4 and 12 talks about this two-edged sword. This is the word of God. But it cuts here first. It cuts both ways, but it's going to cut me. God wants us to go back to the old ways. There's nothing wrong with turning that plate over once a week, fasting, praying, seeking God, exalting each other more highly than ourselves. Be very careful how you judge. And with the measure you judge, it will be measured back into you. You're not always the person, you're not the judge. We don't need to be critical. That critical spirit that we have, criticizing her. Look, this is a whole new generation of young people. They don't dress the way we used to dress. They don't look the way we used to look. You know? I mean, they just don't. But when I think back, way back, this is Carol. We used to wear halter tops too, right? and bell bottoms and those type of things. So things, all that's old is new again. It just goes around and around. There's nothing new under the sun. The preacher said, there's nothing new under the sun. Okay, so everything that was is again. God wants to fellowship with us. He wants more time. He wants more good time. I read the scripture when I was young in the Lord to pray without ceasing. I did not understand that. I understand it now. I understand when the Holy Spirit said, I call you no more servant, I call you a friend. And the servant don't know what's going on with the Father, but the friend does. So as a friend, sometimes I think. And I may even get on the phone and talk to a friend for an hour, for two hours, okay? Especially if you haven't talked to this friend in some time. You have a lot to catch up on. 
If God calls us friends, we have to always have something to talk about. You always have something to talk about with your friend, you know? And, and, and it's not always complaining and murmuring. Sometimes it's just telling him what your day is like, or what you anticipate, or what's coming down. You know, you know, God, I have court next week, and I don't know what that's going to work what that's going to be like. But I'm not fearful because you have not given me a spirit of fear, but a power of love and a sound mind. So I'm just asking right now that you would give me the favor as you always give me. I ask that you would bless the judge. I ask that you would bless his family. Okay? So that he won't be preoccupied when he comes into the courtroom. That his mind will be fixed and, and steadfast on what the issues are. Okay? That's talking to God. That's talking to God. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to the doctor today, and, and I don't know, I mean, it's just some checkup, but I thank you for preparing my mind for whatever's coming. I thank you for preparing the doctor. I thank you for his family. I thank you for his practice, his employees. I thank you that everything is in order, so that when I walk in there, he will not be preoccupied, okay? His mind will be set. His mind will be fixed. We need to pray for those in authority. There's an election coming up. Don't get hung up on that. Please. Please don't. We still pray. But we don't have to listen to all the rhetoric. We don't have to feed our spirits with the rhetoric. They say the same thing over and over and over. You know, I pray for the newscasters. I feel, feel really bad for them sometimes because that's their, that's their occupations. I mean, that's what they do. But they repeat the same negative stuff over and over and over. And I said, oh my God. Strengthen her, you know, encourage her. Don't let her take this home to her family. This is too much. I just couldn't be a news anchor because it's just too much bad news, you know. I have to be the good news news reporter. Yeah, okay. But anyway, I'm not gonna stay with this. I'd like to uh, say, and I think I've already said to be prepared in season, out of season, correct review, encourage with great patience and careful instructions. Be ready to give every man a reason to share the hope that lies within you. See, people are going to ask you out there. It was two things the Lord impressed upon me, and that is you need to get closer to Him, and when you get close to God, you know what's on the heart of God. And what's on the heart of God? Souls. That's the only thing that's Delaying his coming. He's giving many an opportunity to choose him as Savior and Lord. And that is what he requires of us. He said, We love one another as God to love us. John 3 16. What is this, CJ? I can't hear you. That whosoever, for God, 17, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world for him might be saved. That's his desire. His desire is that we all be saved. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to keep you guys any longer. I think I've said what I had to say, and like I said before, there is no condemnation. If you are the person getting up already at 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning or whatever time God says, it's going to be 10 o'clock in the morning. It could be 8 o'clock in the evening. You know, that's between you and God. God knows all of his children. And we know he knows all of us are different. He knows what time is good for us to fellowship and to meet with him. Okay? If you're already doing that, if you're already loving the brother, if you're praying for your pastor, and it's very, very important to pray for our pastors and not to judge our pastors. We're not here to judge our pastors. You know, God said that it's very, very important to pray for the men and women of God. Pastors, preachers, the, the, the fivefold ministry. We need, to, we need to pray for them. But especially pastors, because I think that's the only one that God says that he watches over your soul. And, and, and God said he's going to have to give an account to you. He said, and, and, and don't let that be 
grudging, a, a burden to the mark for him. I, I don't remember the exact words, but he has to give an account for your souls. He's going to give an account to God. You know, I, I normally would tell people all the time, well, my mom used to say every child has to sit on its own bottom. Everybody's going to answer for themselves. And that is true. We are. God's going to ask us, what did we do with what he gave us to do in this earth realm? The pastors, they have to answer for themselves and for us. They answer for us also. So be careful. Not to judge the pastors, but to pray for them. Pray that God will give them the spirit of wisdom and the knowledge and the revelation of Him, the eyes of their understanding constantly being enlightened so they will know the hope of God's calling. Pray for them. Pray the word. I mean, you know, just pray the word. Just, just go in here. Isaiah 11, 1. Pray the word. The spirit of wisdom and power and might, discernment. Pray for your pastors. Pray for their health. Pray for their wealth. Okay? Because when they prosper, you prosper. You prosper. So stop judging. I hear so many people so many days. Because you see now, they're seeing so many pastors on television. So many pastors they didn't get to see before. And so they judge them. They judge them on everything. How they look, what they wear, how they come here, what kind of cars they drive it, what did they say in this. But nah, that's not your business. That's not our business. I mean, they have the answer to God. They are human beings just like we are. They're not super superman. They're super, they're supernatural, okay, in Christ. But otherwise, they're human. So let's, 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 let's pray for our pastors. Let's keep them lifted up. Let's keep them covered with the blood. Let's pray that God's favor will follow them and cover them like a shield. Okay. Amen. Amen. You want to say something? Can we help the family? Before I sit down, the reason why it wasn't just about encouraging, you know, in many times in this passage that I read in 1 Samuel 30, it talks about how green the men were how grieved and how distressed that they were because of what happened. And I tried to compare that what, to what we went through over the last two or three years. So many unexpected things happened that we didn't expect because we had no clue that this pandemic was coming. But in the midst of that, I found that I'm still talking to people who are trying to recuperate from the pandemic. My daughter, I'd like to say a social worker, but that's not just what you are. But she talked to people on the phone every day. We're still coping. Okay? Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. People are still trying to get back to what they would consider normal. Okay? Some have literally lost their minds. Some have committed suicide. Okay, there's so many things that's going on. Stress. We may not realize the toll that stress takes on our bodies. You know, it is said that 80% of all illnesses is stress related. That's how serious stress is. So today, the call for prayer it's an altar call, and I'm calling anybody who feel like you need prayer today. It was just prayer to relieve anxiety. But the Bible said, be anxious to nothing. But in all things, for prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, to let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which past understanding will keep your hearts in mind in Christ Jesus. So if there's something that has been said today, or something that you've been dealing with even before you got here, and you just need that two or three, you need someone else to come in agreement with you concerning 
what you've been talking to God about. And I'm going to ask you, if you will, if it's okay with Pastor Jane, if you will, Elf Colleen is going to come up. If you desire prayer, 